Hello, and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual program series. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. Thanks for joining us at home today. Through this programming, we're opening the doors of the National Archives, treasures and documents, billions of records to you while we're stuck at home. There's a little something special for everyone in these programs. Hopefully by now you've been receiving our American Experience emails on Tuesday, our History Snacks uh, emails for families and children on Fridays, and you know all about what's going on and what's coming up. Today we've got a great program. We're gonna explore yet another presidential library. Um, so before we begin and I introduce our featured speaker, I can see from the chat, some of you have been with us before. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end and we will be using the uh, Google um, YouTube chat function. And so if you wanna practice where that is, and I see some of you are already practicing, put in your hometown and state and I will give a shout out later on in the program. We'd love to know where everyone's watching from. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be introducing uh, and talking to the director of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum, Thomas Schwartz. Tom has been with the Hoover Library since 2011. And before that, he served as the Illinois State Historian and Chief Historian of Exhibits and Content at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum, where he directed the Lincoln Collection at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. He's an author and editor. His work has been recognized with a number of presidential, uh, sorry, presidential, that would be interesting, professional awards. You'll have to tell us that there are any presidential awards as well. Uh, today he's gonna take a step back in time, not all the way to Lincoln, but to Herbert Hoover to tell us about his life, his administration. Uh, Tom, are you there? I see you, I want to make sure we can hear you and uh, you're with us. How are you doing today? Uh, thank you, Patrick. Doing well. And how is uh, how's everybody? How's everybody in West Branch? Given uh, everything that we're dealing with, uh, obviously the library's closed. How is everyone there? Staff is doing well. They're eager to return um, on a regular basis, and uh, we're eager to be able to safely reopen to the public when that opportunity availed itself, but appreciate the opportunity to present the library museum virtually to your audience. Great, well, I know you've got a, a great uh, set of images and uh, stories and tales, and I have a feeling we have lots of questions. So I am going to sign off, let you get into your program here and I'll pop back in when we're ready for, for Q and A. So have at it, enjoy. Thank you, Patrick. So you see the uh, exterior of the Hoover Presidential Library Museum. We are the smallest uh, facility in the, uh, of the 14 presidential libraries and museums. Uh, and we are located in West Branch, which was a, founded as a Quaker community. And Hoover, of course, uh, was our first Quaker president. Uh, next slide. So, the question that we always get asked is, uh, if the presidential library system began with Franklin Roosevelt, how did Hoover get in? Uh, because he predates Roosevelt. Well, two things occurred. What you're seeing is the Hoover Tower at Stanford University. Um, Herbert Hoover was with President Wilson and Versailles in Europe heading the American Relief Administration, providing humanitarian uh, assistance to countries in the aftermath of World War I. He learned that many of the records of countries that were removed from the map of Europe and broken up into new countries, that those records were threatened with destruction. So at his own expense, Hoover had them sent over to Stanford University. He made arrangements with Stanford to rent stack space in their library and hired out of pocket uh, two assistants uh, to catalog the, the materials. And over the years, those uh, collections continued to grow. Uh, Hoover also then included his own uh, private and uh, public papers in that. So what you're seeing, he intended to be his presidential 
uh, library. Uh, next slide. What had happened was that in the 50s, Stanford University began to question why they had this private institution in the middle of the campus and why Stanford had no control over the future of the Hoover Institution. Um, at the same time, what you see is a Grant Wood painting of Her Herbert Hoover's birthplace home. Hoover always hated this painting, uh, not because of the artist. Uh, Grant Wood is obviously uh, a very famous American artist, but that his home for five people that he grew up in is actually at the very end of the structure. It's that little almost summer kitchen. Um, and so <clears throat> Hoover tried to buy this home in 28 when he was running for president and uh, to uh, have it reflect the actual two room cottage that uh, he and four of the members of his family uh, grew up in. Uh, next slide. The woman who owned the house was actually making pretty good revenue giving tours to the public at a dime a throw. And so she wouldn't sell it to Hoover in 28. When she dies in the 30s, her family didn't want it anymore and they sell it to Hoover. Lou Hoover, Mrs. Hoover, uh, removed those front portions and she took the original cottage, relocated it properly on, on the grounds and uh, restored it to its appearance that you see today. It's now operated by the National Park Service. There's about 186 acres that surround the Hoover Presidential Library that the Park Service operates, including uh, not only Hoover's birthplace home, but the Quaker meeting house he attended, the uh, a reconstruction of his father's blacksmith shop, and then he and Mrs. Hoover are buried on the knoll behind the library museum. Uh, when they were able to purchase and restore the house, they created a foundation to raise funds to make sure that this would be made available to the public free of charge. Um, in the 50s, at the same time, there were troubles at Stanford over the future of the Hoover Institution. The locals decided that they wanted to build a small museum to emphasize that uh, they had, uh, they were the home of, of a president. And they were asking Hoover, could you give us maybe one or two original items uh, to put in the museum? And after thinking about the future of his legacy at Stanford, Hoover thought, you know, the Presidential Libraries Act that was written so Harry Truman could have a library and future presidents could have libraries applies to any living president. So he decided to take over the operation, the museum project of the locals and give them something they never thought they'd get. And that is a presidential library and museum. Next slide. So here you see Herbert Hoover and uh, Harry Truman on the opening of uh, the, the library museum, Hoover's 88th birthday, August 10th of 1962. After they had toured the library, they sat down in a reconstruction of the Oval Office uh, that was part of the original library, our museum, it no longer is part of the new museum. And uh, Truman turns to Hoover and says, well, Mr. President, you have a damn fine library except one problem. And Hoover said, what's that, Mr. President? And Truman says, it's too damn small. And Hoover supposedly smiled and said, that's okay. The federal government will overstaff it. Um, next slide. So the federal government uh, hasn't overstaffed it. Um, our staff is shrinking. Uh, the footprint did expand, but we're still, again, at uh, under 48,000 square feet of, uh, of a footprint, which makes us the smallest. Um, most presidential museums, the presidency is the major accomplishment in the lives of that individual. With Hoover, 
it's not quite the case. His major accomplishments occur before and after the presidency. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time highlighting that so you get a better understanding uh, of the man. This shows a food distribution center in Belgium by the Commission for Relief in Belgium. 1914, Hoover's living in London with his wife and two young sons. He's a millionaire many times over made being a mining engineer and having his own consulting business. He's ready to return home once the war begins. Uh, and a mining engineering friend visited him and said, I need your help. I married a Belgian woman. And when the Germans tried to do a quick defeat of France, they violated Belgium neutrality. 90% of Belgium is occupied by the Germans as well as large portions of Northern France. The British and French have imposed a blockade. They won't let food enter the country. And so roughly seven to eight million people were beginning to have uh, food problems that hunger started uh, occurring in major cities. Hoover is able to break the log jam by creating what today we call a non-governmental organization. Commission for Relief in Belgium. It didn't represent any particular country. It was created by Hoover as an individual, uh, by Brant Whitlock, who was the American ambassador to Belgium as an individual, the ambassador to Spain and to Belgium as an individual. And by creating this neutral entity, the British, French, and Germans allowed it to take uh, foodstuffs to feed non-combatants. Uh, and so from 1914 to 1918, Hoover raised over a billion dollars in 1910 dollars in order to provide sufficient food to feed uh, the population uh, of, of Belgium and Northern France. Next slide. When the US gets involved in the war, Hoover turns the administration of the Commission for Relief of Belgium over to neutral parties. He comes back to the United States and Woodrow Wilson immediately puts him into his cabinet as the head of the US Food Administration. Hoover's task was to provide sufficient foodstuffs for the war effort. Now there are two ways that you can increase the amount of food available. The first is to increase production, but that takes time. The second, is to get Americans to volunteer or to reduce their consumption of food. What Hoover was able to do is to get American housewives to sign pledge cards. And their pledge card, they would have to Hooverize. Every day of the week, they'd have to give up one or more of the four major uh, food components that um, were necessary for the war effort, flour or wheat, sugar, meat, fat. Uh, and so you had meatless Mondays, wheatless Wednesdays. Hoover was able to get Americans to voluntarily, voluntarily, not by food restrictions, but voluntarily reduce their consumption by 15% of these four major components. Next slide. After the war, uh, Hoover headed the American Relief and uh, administration that shows all of his food relief efforts. And then from 1921 to 23, he also fed uh, non-combatants in uh, Russia during the Russian famine. And of course, at this time, the Russian revolution was going on. And so he was doing, uh, he was feeding civilian populations controlled by both the Bolshevik government and the white Russian government, which again, uh, was opposed by the British and even by the American governments, uh, but Hoover felt that hungry people have no politics. Next slide. From 1920, Warren G. Harding gets elected president. He offers Hoover to be either Secretary of Interior or Secretary of Commerce. And of course, Interior is much more prestigious. And so Hoover, of course, takes Secretary of Commerce, which was a sleepy black backwater government agency. He builds it into one of the most important government agencies under the Harding and Coolidge administrations. Pr 
perhaps most significantly and what lives with us today is Hoover getting uh, industries to create industrial standards. This lowered the cost of goods to consumers and it also uh, allow consumers, no matter what company they bought a product from within that industry, it would work with parts from other companies in that industry. So for example, there were 42 different size milk containers when Hoover came in as Secretary of Commerce. He got the dairy industry to get it down to pint, half gallon, a quart, half gallon, gallon, which stays with us today. The, the size brick in your home and in your buildings was the size set established when Hoover Secretary of Commerce. Um, the plumbing standards to this day were those set by Hoover, uh, the size lumber, and it goes on and on. Next slide. So 1928, Hoover gets elected by a landslide. Now, of course, most of the people connect Hoover with the collapse of the market in October and the the, the depression, uh, actually not the depression, but the great depression, uh, which makes it even worse. We have to remind people that Hoover had accomplishments in his administration that uh, tend to be overshadowed. Probably the one that most of the public knows is that he used the power of the federal government to put Al Capone in jail um, by getting him on a tax evasion. Uh, next slide. But this is what most people know Hoover by, these shanty towns known as Hoovervilles. Um, the mischaracterization of Hoover was that he was a do-nothing president who was cold and heartless and didn't care. As you know from that brief overview of his humanitarian efforts, that's clearly not a cold-hearted person. Um, there were systemic issues that transcended uh, the Hoover administration. We call it the Great Depression because typically it's dated from the collapse of the market in October of 29, and it goes all the way to the end of World War II. In fact, the markets don't regain their pre-depression values until the early 1950s. And so there are a lot of complicated issues, both domestic and uh, international, uh, that Hoover was dealing with uh, that he wasn't able to solve, uh, but his successors also had trouble solving. Next slide. So this little video clip uh, shows Hoover tossing the medicine ball around. He's got it right now, he just threw it. There are members of the cabinet and also Supreme Court justice that make up this group. It's a nine pound medicine ball. This develops into a sport called Hoover Ball. He's the only president to have a sport named after him. So think about this with a net, three people on a side throwing this nine pound medicine ball over the net, catching it and having to toss it back. The White House physician did this so Hoover could lose weight. He was 210 when he took office, doing Hoover Ball every day from uh, between seven and eight. He dropped down to 175 pounds when he left office. Next slide. When Hoover left the presidency, it was not on the best of terms with Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt and the New Dealers constantly reminded Amer the American public that it was Hoover's depression um, and that Hoover didn't know how to solve the problems that that's what the New Deal was doing. So it was very difficult when members of the Brain Trust would tell President Roosevelt, well, you know, the smartest person on this issue is Herbert Hoover. We should bring him in for advice. You can't very well bring someone in for advice when you've already labeled them as being the person who caused all the problems to begin with. When Franklin Roosevelt dies, Harry Truman takes over and he realizes that there are going to be immense problems with feeding clothing and providing medical assistance in a post-war world. The only person who's had experience feeding and providing aid to tens of millions of people during the war and after the war was Herbert Hoover. 
So he calls Hoover to the White House, asks him if he will help do a post-war assessments need. And a 71-year-old man says, sure. Um, so in a 58 days, he goes to like 38 countries to do his fact-finding mission. And that's the first of many tasks that Truman uh, will use Hoover uh, to assist him. What Hoover does, uh, he, he lives to be 90. And so he has this very long post-presidency. Hoover essentially sets the model of how to be, how an ex-president should behave as a counselor to the president. Next slide. This is our research room. Uh, these are students from Culver Stockton. Uh, we have about 10 million manuscripts, about 280, 68 cubic feet of photographic AB material and about 15,600 artifacts. And so um, the research room is used quite a bit, uh, largely as a way to teach college students, high school students and junior high students how to use primary sources. Next slide. This is a picture of Rose Wilder Lane. Those of you who listen to Alan Price about the Kennedy Library learn that they have the papers of Ernest Hemingway. We have the papers of Rose Wilder Lane. Uh, she did a biography of Hoover in 1920. She is credited as being one of the founders of the libertarian movement. Uh, but more importantly, she's the ghost editor of her mother's books, Laura Ingalls Wilder, The Little House on the Prairie series. And so among Rose's papers, we have the big chief tablets that contain her mother's uh, drafts of uh, her writings. Next slide. And so we end on this note. Um, this is kind of the entrance to our reconstruction of the Waldorf uh, Astoria uh, apartment that Hoover lived in and the last decades of his life. The file cabinets contained uh, his research notes and drafts of the many books that he wrote as ex-president. Uh, but what's most important is what's behind in that frame picture. It's a 1865 print by Alexander Hay Ritchie of a painting done by Francis Bicknell Carpenter hanging in the US Capitol. And it shows Lincoln, reading the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet. Today, September 22nd, marks the 157th anniversary of that event. Hoover's grandfather bought it. Um, as I said, the Quakers were abolitionists. West Branch was a station on the Underground Railroad. John Brown visited West Branch a year before his failed assault on Harper's Ferry. Hoover used Lincoln as his model uh, for what the president should be, what the presidency should be, uh, but also how an individual should live their life. He thought Lincoln's life exemplified the notion of the open field and fair chance, the right to rise, and also expanding the boundaries of liberty and the aspirations of the declaration that all men are created equal. The other part though, that Hoover shared with Lincoln, I mean, both were self-made men, both ended up in a much more prosperous position than where they began in life. But self-made in Lincoln's notion of the term and in Hoover's, the more important aspect was the making of the self, um, improving your character and moral core. And so, um, it's important to kind of end on this note, not only because it's the anniversary of this very important uh, moment in history where uh, the boundaries of freedom were expanded, but also what made America unique, what Hoover thought, Lincoln thought made America unique and what Hoover thought made America unique. And that is this right to rise, where you begin in life is not necessarily where you end and the opportunity um, to improve your moral core to help the larger good. Thank you, that does it. 
Oh, that's fantastic, Tom. Thank you uh, for that overview. And uh, as you've, I know you've looked at a couple of the previous presidential library uh, videos that um, I have had my opportunity in this job to go to a number of presidential libraries. However, I have not made it to West Branch. So it's, it is on the list uh, when we're allowed to travel again. And so it's great to see, great to see that preview. And I look forward to seeing the, uh, the park service, you know, the land there. I'm sure it's, it's impressive. So uh, I want to invite our viewers now to ask questions. As a reminder on the uh, YouTube chat, put your questions in there while we're waiting for those to queue up. We've got a couple here. I want to welcome folks from all over the country. We've got Weehawk in New Jersey, Chevy Chase, Maryland, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Waverly, Iowa, uh, St. George, Utah. We've got Riverview, Florida, Durham, North Carolina, San Diego, California, White Bear Lake, Minnesota, several folks in the Washington metropolitan area, uh, Cary, North Carolina, Madison, Mississippi, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, Norman, Oklahoma, Bellevue, Washington. Got a lot of Hoover followers from all over the country, which is, uh, which is terrific. Um, you talked a little bit about the research room before we jump into the questions as they're starting to queue up. Um, are there researchers, I know obviously you use it for students now, are there researchers coming in still writing and researching the administration and the papers there, or has that really been exhausted? Um, I'm curious about um, that side of things. So the interesting thing about Hoover is that um, a lot of the researchers coming in, um, because the as Commerce Secretary, he gathered so much data on so many different topics. We get people coming in essentially to look at that data, not necessarily Hoover, and um, which, which is fine. I mean, that, that's the, the purpose of the archive for people to come in and to use the materials in, in new and different ways. There has been um, obviously the, the biographies within the last 20 years, um, the, the initial biographies of Hoover were either very critical or almost hagiography. And what's now is that there's a balance. I think most historians that have studied Hoover understand that um, there's a lot that he did that was right, especially some of the economic steps he took during the depression. Uh, and there is a lot more continuity between programs that Hoover began as president and what carries on in the New Deal. Um, of course, neither Hoover nor Roosevelt would ever, if they were alive, would ever agree to that. Uh, but I mean, I think historians uh, are, are tending to see trends and understandings that begin with one that continue with, with the other. There's a great new biography by Ken White, uh, Kenneth White, Herbert Hoover, an extraordinary man in extraordinary times. And um, he's a Canadian publisher writer. Um, who it's not an uncritical biography, but I think, uh, you know, largely the assessment is that uh, he finds Hoover to be this uh, perpetual motion machine and is involved in so many things and which is difficult of, of why people have a hard time writing about him because they have to master so many different subject areas uh, and he lived 90 years, so an incredibly long life. And, um, but I think, you know, again, people have an, are getting an understanding of the Great Depression, um, the limits of, um, you know, economic knowledge. There was no macroeconomic really at that time. Uh, Keynes's general theory didn't come out until 36, although he was practicing it in Great Britain. Um, although Lincoln, or excuse me, Hoover was doing um, public works programs and he was doing deficit spending. The problem is, is that neither Hoover nor Roosevelt were willing to 
spend, do deficit spending at the levels required. And that's why it really took the war effort um, to force spending at levels um, that no rational politician would ever, you know, embrace. Um, so we've had a couple of questions about, uh, you mentioned Stanford, are there papers at Stanford and papers at the library? I think people are just trying to understand um, where one goes to explore Hoover if they really wanted to dive in. So actually it's kind of a global search because 1914, as I said, uh, he was living in London, but he and, and Lou, his wife estimated they had traveled the globe five times. Uh, in that period uh, of their marriage to 1914 and their 10-year-old son twice. So um, the Hoover story is a global one and it's scattered all around. Most of his papers, uh, the, the way that he decided the division, what stayed at the Hoover Institution, what came to West Branch was that he considered his mining career, um, his work with the Commission for Relief in Belgium, the U.S. Food Administration, uh, and the American Relief Administration remained at the Hoover Institution in Palo Alto. Those that he considered his public career as Secretary of Commerce, as President and Post-Presidency came to West Branch. And of course, he was still alive when the library opened. And so he had materials in those file cabinets, and those are only a few of many that were in the Waldorf Astoria. And so when he died um, on October 20th, 1964, all that material had to be crated and, and shipped and sorted. So, um, you know, anytime you try to do a division, you're gonna have pockets of stuff that get sent to the wrong place. Mm -hmm. um, but the wonders the marvels of digitization allow us to scan, put it on our website, and we could knit collections together uh, with di digital images. So sure. You know. So what about um, presidential objects, gifts from heads of state? So you say the public uh, part of the his life is is there. Does that include so folks come to the museum? Are they going to see gifts, or was that not yeah, part of yeah, his? But but understand during the depression, there weren't, um, there were only two state dinners. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, one was for the King of Siam uh, and there was one other. So um, we do have a lot of the gifts that who were received from foreign uh, dignitaries uh, often came before he was president and after he continued to get gifts uh, from foreign dignitaries long after uh, he left the White House. And those are on display. Mm -hmm. uh, so a question about um, the um, Hoover's role providing aid. So gave, uh, he was key to providing aid in Europe, uh, World War I and World War II, but not to Americans. Is that how you would frame that? Obviously he had different roles at different times, but I think there's a question about clarifying that. So, yeah, most um, his work with the Commission for Relief in Belgium, the American Relief Administration, um, and then he set up aid societies for Poland and Finland um, in 39 when the Germans and the Russians were uh, had invaded those countries. Um, he tried to set up something similar to the CRB in World War II and was unsuccessful. Um, but then with the post-war war world, um, many of the people that he had trained with the Commission for Relief in Belgium started heading um, many of the humanitarian agencies that the United, new United Nations created. So for example, Maurice Pate, whom started off with Hoover in Belgium in 1914, uh, uh, he heads UNICEF and essentially um, 
bases the structure of UNICEF on what he learned from Hoover in Belgium and gets a Nobel Peace Prize in 65, um, which he declines and actually he dies before it's awarded, but he asks that it be given to the agency. Um, there's a whole generation of people dealing with non-government organizations and humanitarian organizations after World War II that essentially Hoover mentored. Um, and again, these are topics that again, people are just starting to look at. Um, this, this whole creation of NGOs, um, obviously what Hoover begins to explore in World War I gets its full expression in World War II is, you know, how do you take a limited amount of food and stretch it to deal with the needs of all of these people? You know, part of it was Hoover had scientists determine how many calories a day it took to keep a person alive and then ask them to, you know, how do those calories um, get divided into nutrients. They didn't talk about vitamins, but they talked about nutrients. And so essentially fats, carbs, sugars. And by using that, Hoover is able to determine how to take the limited amount of food he knew he was getting and feed the largest number of people uh, and giving them the necessary calories to keep them keep them alive. And of course that gets greater uh, refinement with World War II in the aftermath of World War II. Okay. Um, I know we were talking about this before uh, we came on. We've got a couple of questions about the president's uh, fishing habits. Do you have exhibits at the, um, uh, at the museum about his passion for fishing? And then I have a specific question here. I'm gonna see if I can read it. Uh, Hoover's fishing camp on Skyline Drive in Virginia is fascinating. Is there an exhibit or about his time at the camp? And I don't know if you know about that one or not, but fishing as the topic. So um, Herbert and Lou Hoover um, looked at several locations to create a presidential getaway. Um, and they ended up buying about 180 acres in the Shenandoah Mountains along the Rapidan River. It was about two hours outside of Washington, DC. And Lou designed 13 cabins um, and they bought the materials, the Marine Corps that guarded them, built them. And on weekends, the theory was Hoover would go and be able to fish. It was up high enough to get away from the mosquitoes. Um, and that predates um, that, that when they left office, Hoover uh, then turned it over to the Commonwealth of Virginia with instructions to turn it over to the federal government. Franklin Roosevelt used it once. Um, it was too rough hewn for uh, his needs. And so he went to a, a camp in Maryland called Camp Shangri-La, which of course is renamed after President Eisenhower's grandson's birth, Camp David. Uh, but the Park Service still operates four of the structures uh, at Camp Rapidan. And um, there's actually a book called Herbert Hoover, The Fishing President, uh, that explores all of Hoover's fishing habits throughout his life, the places he went, the, the types, types of fish he, he sought. He was big on catch and relief and fly fishing. He did his own flies. Um, he then switched to bone fishing at the end of his life down in Florida, uh, again, for the sport of it. Um, the one thing that people comment on as you exit our permanent galleries, there's a figure of Herbert Hoover in his waders with a jacket, a tie, fishing. And people said, you know, asked, did he really wear a, wear a jacket and tie when he fished? 
And the answer is yes. The reason being a photographer once caught him at Rapidan with his shirt sleeves rolled up and without a tie. And he thought that that was unpresidential, that the dignity of the office required him to be photographed with a coat and tie. And so um, some of the film clips that, that we have on our YouTube channel show him on these boats with a coat and tie. And, you know, <laughs> but again, that, that's something that he thought that the, the presidency and, and, and being an ex-president, uh, it required him to maintain that dignity. Times have, have changed a little bit on that. <laughs> Yeah, that front, especially in the post presidency. Um, I know we're, we have a little bit more time. So I've got a couple of questions that hopefully can be relatively uh, succinct uh, answers, yeses or nos. Um, are any of the Hoover family involved with uh, the library? Yes. Uh, or the museum? Yes. Uh, the only living grandson um, who knew his grandfather is still involved, Andrew Hoover and then a ton of uh, great grandchildren. Um, probably the one that your audience might know best is Margaret Hoover, who has reprised Firing Line on PBS. Great. Um, did, um, is the great relief effort, the papers when he was, I guess, uh, head of commerce, the great, relief effort of the, of the Mississippi River flood of 1927. Are those papers at the library? Yeah, we have a lot of stuff that uh, comments on um, the Mississippi flood of 27. Yeah. Okay. Um, most of the presidential libraries have an Oval Office exhibit. Do you have one? I believe we saw a photo where there was originally one, but we did, but um, that was replaced uh, in 92. The, the, ga the permanent galleries that people will see date from 1992. And the Oval Office was replaced with the Waldorf uh, Gallery. Okay, and uh, is the Grant Wood, this is a very specific question, but maybe you know, is the Grant Wood painting of the Hoover Childhood Home on view in West Branch, Iowa. No, no, we don't no. have. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have galleries or information? Um, oh, well, no, sorry. We've already covered that one. Um, I think we've had, oh, uh, one question here about, did he have a relationship? Uh, you and I have talked about, he kind of developed the, the before Carter, the post-presidency, he was really one defining it. Uh, did he have a relationship with um, uh, Eisenhower and Kennedy and those administrations, or was it more of the formal, um, you know, as a post-president respect and so forth? With Eisenhower, it was more pro forma because he backed uh, Robert Taft. Uh, but with Kennedy, uh, again, uh, Hoover knew John Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy. And um, Joseph Kennedy made sure that all of his sons got to know Herbert Hoover. So we actually have this really neat correspondence um, of fan letters. Uh, and that's not an overstatement uh, that Jackie Kennedy writes thanking Hoover for, you know, the lunch that he uh, provided for she and her husband and that, you know, they're big fans of theirs. Bobby Kennedy serves and the staff of the second Hoover Commission under Eisenhower. Um, the other interesting thing between Herbert Hoover and John F. Kennedy, Herbert Hoover is the first president that served without any compensation. Um, Hoover never took a dime for his humanitarian efforts uh, for relief organizations as secretary uh, in the US Food Administration as Secretary of Commerce as president or on presidential commissions. John Kennedy follows that same tradition. He never takes compensation uh, when he was in elected office. Uh, and the only other president to follow in that tradition is the current president who has uh, waived his uh, payment uh, as president. 
Well, you mentioned the commission, and uh, before I get to a couple of ones, can you discuss, did the Hoover Commission lead to significant reforms? Yes, I mean, 80%, um, this was under Harry Truman. Truman knew that all of the deficit spending for the war and then for the rebuilding of Europe, that um, the government had to dial down uh, its spending levels. And so the Hoover Commission was to find ways to consolidate uh, overlapping services and provide efficiencies and kind of reduce the overall cost to government. 80% of the recommendations were uh, approved by Congress. What blew up uh, instituting those reforms was the Korean War, which of course required the government again to uh, do more spending. The second Hoover Commission under Eisenhower was more pro forma. And again, by that time, we're in the Cold War and the space race and, you know, all of those other things. So um, like most commissions <laughs> that, that look to reform government, they, they have great uh, results on paper and it's much harder to implement it because life intrudes. Sure. Um, okay, a couple other ones here. Uh, did Hoover have a pet and is that pet showcased at the library? Um, the most popular picture that was requested by Hoover shows his uh, Belgian police dog, King Tut, um, and it's next to him. Um, the Hoovers actually had many dogs. When King Tut died, uh, Hoover was still in the White House and they didn't announce it to the public because they knew they would be inundated with all of these puppies from <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, the other kind of misconception is that their youngest son, Alan, when they, he was secretary of commerce and they were living in uh, a house on S Street, which still stands and is the Myanmar embassy. Um, Alan had two alligators um, that he wanted to raise. When it got to be colder, uh, Mrs. Hoover, who was very tolerant, just said, no, I don't want those in my bathroom tubs. And so they were given to the Smithsonian, uh, the National Zoo. And um, many times you'll find in the internet that the Hoovers had these alligators in the White House. That's not true. Uh, they had long <laughs> been uh, given to kind of proper caregivers at the National Zoo. I see. So before we had the giant pandas at the National Zoo, we had the Hoover alligators. I've got it. So I, I have true or false, a couple of true or false before I get to that. Uh, there was, what do you know about a fire set in the White, in the white House on Christmas day of 29? Can you give us a little background on that? Yeah, it was Christmas Eve of 29. Christ oh, uh, Christmas Eve, okay. And it destroyed the Oval Office. Now, uh, fortunately, there weren't a lot of important state papers in the Oval Office at that time. And um, it was a four alarm fire. So it was huge. Wow. Uh, the Hoovers were having a party for staff and um, they had to, Mrs. Hoover kept the party going. The president and his sons went to go see what they could to save things out of that area. Um, the following year when they had the Christmas party uh, Mrs. Hoover gave the boys of staff members toy fire trucks uh, as again, kind of a little personal joke. Uh, but because the Oval Office was destroyed, um, one of the incredible things about Mrs. Hoover, she did an unpublished history of the White House and its furnishings and realized that on the second floor, what were bedrooms were actually the original Lincoln cabinet room. So if people remember that print that we ended with, that's the Lincoln cabinet room. 
Lou restored that to its original appearance and Hoover used that as essentially his office. Um, he much preferred that to um, what was a restored Oval Office. And in fact, Franklin Roosevelt, when he became president, moved it because it was kind of in the middle of the East Wing and had to move it to the end so he could have easier access with his wheelchair. Um, and you mentioned uh, Mrs. Hoover, are, are there uh, papers and documents uh, in, the, in the museum there as well? Um, so the documents that they'll see in the exhibit galleries are uh, very high quality facsimiles. Uh, simply because displaying documents for long periods of time is not uh, appropriate. Uh, but uh, they are available in the research room in the collections. And any, any member of the public can come request a research card, a researcher card, and there's a little bit of a training they have to do. Um, but uh, we have people from the general public come in to do uh, research work and also genealogical work. Um, one of the nice things about all of the reading rooms in the National Archives is that they have access to ancestry. And so people come in, you know, to do their family histories as well. Great. So I think I've got a couple of, uh, to close out a couple of yes, no. So we've heard about Hooverizing. Uh, we heard about uh, Hooverville and Hoover Ball. Um, <laughs> Yes or no? Uh, any relation to Hoover Vacuum? No. 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 Okay. Hoover <laughs> Dam? Yes. Um, Herbert Hoover, as Secretary of Commerce, um, took uh, over the Colorado River Commission, which had been going nowhere, and got all of these contentious states that share the water resources of the Colorado River to agree uh, to its use, and also the creation of the Hoover Dam was part and parcel of how to control the floodwaters, but also how to generate hydroelectric power to provide to those areas. And um, there's a great controversy over the naming, uh, because if you look at, at the congressional reports, sometimes it's called the Boulder Dam Project, sometimes it's called uh, the Black River Project, sometimes it's called the Hoover Dam. Um, Hoover, when he was president, put lots of funds to speed up the construction of the dam, but also to provide literally hundreds of jobs for unemployed uh, individuals. Uh, it was again, part of that stim public works stimulus. Um, it wasn't completed and dedicated until 36. By that time, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's um, cabinet member, Harold Ickes, refused to um, use the name Hoover in connection with the dam and insisted it had to be Boulder. Um, there are articles written about this that point out, you know, why uh, Hoover Dam would have been appropriate. Anyway, Harry Truman settled the matter. He had mem Congress officially name it the Hoover Dam while he was president and that's settled it. Very good. Now, if I heard correctly, and I've learned a lot about Hoover in the last hour, he worked, he was in the cabinet for Woodrow Wilson, is that correct? Right. Okay, uh, so I think we have a clip because you talked about Hoover Ball and I think we have a clip if my staff can play this clip. I don't know if you're gonna find Herbert Hoover in this clip, but I'm fascinated to know. So this is um, a clip of Woodrow Wilson's exercise regime with his, uh, with his cabinet on the White House lawn, all dressed apparently in their khakis and white shirts, doing, uh, Demonstrating to the American public that it's important to be in shape. Yeah. And I don't know if we've got Hoover in there. So that's the end of that clip that the, the video goes on. Uh, so we can 
just uh, take the creature off. But I wanted to say, I think yeah, it's yeah, possible I mean, he, he, he was inspired by his time in the cabinet that when he became president, he was uh, there. So we'll, we'll send you that clip and see if you can and find him. That will be uh, part of, we have a sports exhibition that is um, coming along next year. Now it'll be in the fall of next year uh cool. in washington and that will be featured as one of the ways many ways the government tries to engage the public obviously in sports and exercise and so forth so hoover ball i will have to talk to the curator to see if hoover ball makes the cut as we'll, well, well as this we'll send you one with instructions on how to play um, excellent and well, I've, I've also learned that there's a world championship in in yeah, west branch every, it's, every it's year still alive and well so yeah. um I, I, well we didn't do it this year because of covid but sure. um you know, because he had lived abroad so long, no one knew what his political affiliation was. And um, then people thought he was a Democrat. So in 1920, you had uh, Franklin Roosevelt writing to the head of the Democratic National Committee saying, you know, who would be a wonderful candidate to head our presidential ticket? Um, and Hoover then had to come out and indicate now I'm a Theodore Roosevelt progressive Republican. And, um, how, and there were even attempts in 28 to try to disqualify him uh, because uh, critics claimed he had lived abroad so long that he forfeited his American <laughs> citizenship yeah. and right to vote. Um, and Hoover had to get uh, uh, legal opinions to show that in fact he could run. So it's not a new idea that politicians accuse other politicians of not being eligible to run for president. This is, oh, correct. This is, this is not a new idea. Got it. Well, Tom, this has been a terrific time. Uh, we've had a great crowd uh, from obviously all over the country learning about Herbert Hoover before and after, during and after his administration and very long post-presidency. So I appreciate the insights. I look forward to making my way to West Branch when the opportunity allows and, uh, and want to thank you for, for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Patrick. All right, well, I have a few closing announcements for our viewers. We appreciate all of you who have joined us, especially our donors and our members. Uh, you too can be a part of our, our cool group of members uh, and history buffs by becoming a member at archivesfoundation.org. And as you already know, if you've been watching, we've got the best gift shop in Washington, even though the the real gift shop is closed. Our e-store is open at nationalarchivesstore.org. And uh, I hope you'll, you'll join. We've got a sale going on through the, through the end of the month. So I hope you'll check it out. Uh, and then we've got some programs still coming up um, next week on the 29th. Uh, we will uh, invite you to explore old Navy log books and how the archives, a major archives digitization project is unlocking weather today. Kevin Wood, who's with NOAA, uh, as a climate scientist uh, with NOAA and the University of Washington, has been working on this project for a while and has turned in these old, the data in the old Navy log books uh, into data visualization and is helping learn about the weather of today, why we have the weather we have today. So it's really fascinating using old documents and applying technology of today to learn about the world we're living in today. I hope you'll join us on the 29th at five o'clock. And then if you're interested in a conversation that's happening across our country, race and reform in America, we're hosting a fundraiser. It's our first ever online fundraiser. We'll hope you join us. It's a ticketed event on October 6th in the evening. If you go to archivesfoundation.org slash rights, we're gonna have Soledad O'Brien moderating a panel that includes Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian Taylor Branch, Dr. Ibram Kendi, who's a known uh, uh, academic and uh, speaker on the issue of race and Wes Lowry, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, journalist. So uh, visit our website and I hope you'll join us for that special program. You can keep up with all of our programs if you follow us on our social media platforms. So remember what is past is prologue. Until next time, on behalf of the National Archives Foundation, thank you for joining us today.